our YouTube page a little later. Uh, but with that, I'm going to turn things over to Casey. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we jump into our young adult teen tween uh, brainstorming session where we open it up, um, I did want to show you all. I'm going to share my screen for just a couple minutes. Um, for those who were here last year, this will probably look familiar to you. I did create a Google Sheet that will be available to everybody as just sort of a living document for you to be able to go in and add any ideas that you want to share with your colleagues across the state. Um, you have the ability to come in and change this yourself. You don't have to go through me. Um, I am going to share this uh, Google link out in the chat, uh, but I will also send it out in the follow-up email. So don't feel like you have to run in there right now um, to you know, start filling stuff out so that way we can all sort of be present for our conversation. Um, in this Google Sheet, you will see that there is a tab for programming ideas. And so whether this is a program idea you pulled from the CSLP manual, or if this is a program idea that you just decided to um, you know, do, um, by all means, share that information. We also have a tab here for grab and go kit ideas or make and takes. Um, I know that many of you have been doing this very consistently over the last couple of years, um, but I also know that sometimes when you've been doing something long enough, it, sometimes the ideas just start to run dry. And so it's always fantastic when we can share new and exciting ideas with, with our colleagues. If you have any external presenters that really lend themselves to this upcoming theme of oceans of possibility and oceanography, uh, feel free to share that information. We also have a tab for prize or incentive ideas. Um, again, I think especially with this teen age group, I've heard a lot of people talk about how they are just having a really hard time trying to come up with new ideas that their teens get really excited about. And so um, here's a spot for you all to sort of swap ideas, dump in any links if you have links to materials. And then there's also a decorations um, tab. So if you have a really great display idea and you have pictures or a resource you can link to or uh, you know do-it-yourself decorations uh, that I know many of you do there's a spot for that as well and so again I will um, I will send this out so there's no need to to run over there right now if if you really don't want to um, but it will be there this really served as a wonderful living document last year so I really hope that everybody will take advantage of it again um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I would encourage you because if you've never been to one of these brainstorming sessions, they are, they are really intended to be a two-way conversation. My hope is that you all do more talking than I do. Um, and so if you have a webcam, please turn it on so I'm not the only one on screen. Um, I would love to see your face and, and be able to connect. It makes us feel a little bit more like we're sitting in a room together. Um, if you have your web or your microphones, please uh, speak up. I think Daryl is going to uh, unmute the room. Um, I think he's already done that. So just as he mentioned, if you're not in the process of talking, please make sure that you're muted so we're not picking up background noise. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask, does anybody have a young adult summer program that they would like to share with everybody that you're just really excited about? Um, I guess I'll go ahead. Um, so Kate actually found this one. I'm Emma, by the way, from Columbia County Public Library. So I work with um, Kate Duong. We saw this on the Facebook group, Programming Librarians Interest Group, where they did the Pokemon terrariums. And we thought we'd probably do that with like the water Pokemon because our teens are still super into it. That's fantastic. And do you have a link that you might be able to share with that information? I know when we had our children's brainstorming session, there were folks the other day too who were talking about really incorporating water Pokemon. Yeah, um, I'll try. Because um, I don't know if my um, 
web service here blocks Facebook. Same video. <laughs> if not, you can always put it in that Google Doc later or email it to me. Um, that's fine too. Again, if anybody else has a webcam, please feel free to turn it on. I'm feeling a little lonely up here on screen. <laughs> it's a little daunting to stare at my own face. Um, fantastic. Anybody else have a program to share with your colleagues? And Catherine put in the chat that Dunedin planned an outside water balloon site games kickoff party and Bollywood holly powder, color run powder, end of summer outside party. Catherine, that sounds like fun. So when you talk about the, the powder, are you talking kind of similar to like a color, when they do the color fun runs, they've got all this, the, the poofy colors everywhere? Catherine said yes. Anybody else incorporating water into your programs? Any kind of splash pads, any kind of water slides? I've got an idea that I've been uh, tinkering around with. Uh, my name is uh, Tony Pepper I'm with the St. Petersburg Library System. And uh, I actually came up with this idea last year, but then I realized it would probably be better for this one. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat there. Uh, so I came across this. Uh, it's called O-Search, and it tracks uh, sharks and other marine animals. And uh, my idea is that uh, the kids would kind of adopt one of the animals uh, that they that they track, that they put the you know the the GPS on. And they create a narrative about their um, their journeys. So if you click on any one individual animal, you can see its track like all over the the area. And the idea is they kind of make a journal um, of each little track there. So like, what were they seeing when they popped up on July 30th? What what were they doing when they were over here? And uh, some of the tracks, if you click around on them, are, are pretty interesting. Like one of them, you know. The data, the way the data is presented, it cuts across the state. So maybe, you know, they can get fanciful with it and they, you know, write a narrative where the shark meets a friendly person with a pickup truck on the beach and he drives them across the, the state or something like that. Um, and, you know, they can get really invested in their animals and kind of, again, the narrative can be as realistic or as fanciful as they like. You know, we can integrate this into some of the other things that we might do where we, maybe in another craft one, they might make a craft of their animal. Um, but yeah, that's an idea I had. I love this idea, Tony. I think it's amazing. Um, I, um, it, the University of Miami, their big oceanography school, they have something similar, um, but it's just shark tagging and tracking. Um, so this is really cool, too, because I'm I'm on the link you sent, so I'm seeing turtles and. Mm -hmm. and if you, you can actually go across the country, like over on uh, uh, the west coast, there's seals and stuff. So it's it's really up to them, you know, the the, the kind of critter they want to they want to track, and it's really cool too, because like there's one I I was actually ran this by my tab recently, and on the day of one of the critters had popped up on that day. So they really got a sense that these animals are out there right now as we talk. And, you know, that can kind of, again, kind of spark that imagination for them. I love that too, you know, because, which, let me see. Let me see if, yeah, Deanna, you are, hi everybody. Thank you for joining me on screen, by the way. <laughs> it feels much more comfortable. Um, cause Deanna, at the end of our children's brainstorming session, wasn't it you that had put a comment and it was right as we were wrapping up about how it can be kind of difficult. You know, on the one hand, this oceanography theme really lends itself to living in Florida because we have so many different types of bodies of water. But Deanna, you kind of brought up a good point that that can also be a challenge because so many of our kids and adults have kind of heard it before. Um, right? Where, can you hear me? Yes. 
okay, where, where we live on Sanibel, I mean, we're surrounded by water and we have the good fortune of um, having the community that likes to preserve the land. And we have the, we have Ding Darling um, National Sanctuary and we have Crow, which is the care and rehabilitation of wildlife here. And we have uh, the Sea School and we have the Bailey Matthews Shell Muse National Shell Museum. And I haven't reached out to these places before to do any programs because our kids go to them. Um, our, our kids are um, always engaged in something. You know, we have the unusual pre predicament in that, you know, it's kind of an affluent community and the kids are always doing something. And so, and everybody's involved in the community. So they, they've already been, had all this stuff, even since preschool, Put into their it put in their faces but um i reached out to the local organizations because i hadn't before and um, one of them the c school is going to have something new that they hadn't had before which is a mobile unit and they'll have touch tanks and everything and the fact of the matter is is that while i do have local kids here for the summer we have a lot of visitors and so for them they might not have had these experiences yet and so i'm i'm you know they can either participate or not you know i'm providing it and um, the locals will be either supportive or go, oh, I've done that before, but the, I think the people visiting for the first time will really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, and sort of tying those thoughts together, you know, with the resource that Tony shared, I think it's really unique because then you can look at things like seals, which we don't typically have an abundance of here in the state of Florida. So it's kind of cool, Tony, that you shared this resource that can kind of open the door to other types of sea life that we don't normally get here. Um, so that's really cool. And I think a touch tank, you know, it just seems like one of those things that no matter how many times a kid or a teen does it, it still always seems to be exciting. Um, so that's fantastic. Does anybody else have a program idea for your teens, your preteens? What about outreach and marketing? How are you reaching your teens this year? I, I can go back to the program thing because we did have some. I just didn't want to be the only one talking. <laughs> um, we're also going to do this glow painting. We thought about doing like the deep sea and you know how a lot, our area is still popular with like painting with a twist. So we have someone coming over and they're going to do glow in the dark octopuses with the paint on this like cheap canvases because our kids are super into like painting and stuff. Um, and then we stole the idea from the children's interest group, the water cleanup, because our kids are pretty desperate for bright futures <laughs> hours right now, because everywhere around us is closed for volunteering. We're like the only place besides the animal shelter. Yeah, I think um, that waterway cleanup is such a fantastic opportunity. And I will say, I'm, I'm going to plug a webinar that we did back in October um, for those who maybe weren't around or you weren't able to attend or you missed the notification, but um, Amy Jane McMillan from Lee County, last year she developed this amazing teen summer of service or teen SOS program where she built this volunteer program for her teens um, that they were able to do sort of on their own time and in their own spaces which was really helpful, um, but she also tied it into programming. So she would have community members come in and sort of do, um, you know, or virtually do these programs, um, you know, to talk about these different things. And so um, I can also link that whenever I send my follow-up email, if you all are interested in that, if you didn't have a chance to catch it. Um, she really did a fantastic, you know, a fantastic job. Um, it's a great program. Um, and she also talked about how, you know, some things that she's going to be doing different for this upcoming summer, which I think is always beneficial is to kind of learn from other people's experience.
and Miriam did share that Florida has an Adopt the Manatee program, but there is a $25 cost for that. Um, but she linked that into in the chat. And Joanne said, tied into the coral reef creations, going to take a tile, ink, and alcohol and create a really cool looking sea anemone type creature. I don't have a link, however, there are a number of examples online. I love how it works. And I don't think the tiles will be that costly. Especially if you have, um, you know, a place in town that maybe sells leftover building materials, um, or I know some communities have a Habitat for Humanity uh, store. So if they had leftover things, they sell them at a reduced cost. Because um, tiles can be pretty inexpensive. I just know over the last couple of years, a lot of um, home improvement costs have gone way up. <laughs> because of demand. Um, Deanna, I, I saw you put something in the chat. Do you want to share that over mic? Um, I just thought that because teens prefer to have books recommended to them by other teens and not the adults in their lives, that if um, teenagers read a book, uh, whether they like it or not, to write a review of a certain length, they have to meet a couple parameters, um, and uh, then that review can be put with the book. But because they took the time to read the book like a reviewer would and to supply a review, that that is volunteer time, that they're giving to somebody else. So I'll give them so many hours per book and they can earn up to maybe 20 hours of, of volunteer time total for the summer. So because right now we're still not doing teen volunteers either. And but this is something that I did even with ARCs before is have somebody, you know, if you want to take an ARC and uh, read it and give it a review and you think we should order it, I'll order it and I'll I put the review with the book. I love that. Anybody else offering volunteer hours to your teens in a different way that you may want to share? We just started offering volunteer hours through our D&D program because we, we are still doing that and we're lucky enough to do in-person programming. So we have, we're going to start this summer having one of our older teens actually man a campaign and then for two other teens to take notes because our teens are terrible at taking notes on their game and then they keep asking what's going on not in ocean theme but dope and kate for those who may not know what DD is because i know we do have a lot of new staff this year who've moved into these positions do you want to sort of explain it's dungeons and dragons um it's Basically, it's really popular up here and it started with like Stranger Things. It's that game from the 70s where they pretend to do different things, like different quests, but in real life. There, there's a lot of resources online and there's like free manuals. It's really low cost. Like once you get the dice and the manuals, they're basically good forever. Usually very popular, and I know a lot, a lot of libraries were able to move um, their D and Ds, or if they did other types of role playing games, um, gaming programs, were able to move those virtually very easily. Um, so if you're in a library where uh, maybe you haven't been able to jump right back into in person programming, um, that's also another easy, easy virtual program. Miriam said, for crafting materials, don't forget dollar stores like Dollar Tree and Dollar General. They have seasonal items and many materials that can be repurposed for crafts. And I think last year, and I don't remember who shared this, so if this was you and you're on the line, please speak up. But somebody actually also talked about how they had developed um, a partnership with their local Dollar General so that at the end of each season when they had sort of sold all that they could sell and they got to a point where they were just going to throw them out they would actually donate all those leftover seasonal items to the library and so um, they were able to use some of them as incentives or um, 
you know, for different programming things at no cost because they were going to throw them out anyway. Um, so that might be, you know, something worth touching base with your local Dollar General about. Also right now, the Dollar General Literacy Foundation, they have some of their grant applications open. One specifically focuses on summer reading. Um, I know we've had a lot of libraries in Florida over the years that have applied for and been given. Um, so if you've never checked that out, check it out. Or if you have, um, applications are open. And they have several different grants. So you can just sort of go on and see what might apply to you. I'm checking the chat. I want to make sure we're not missing any. I mean, it's all good stuff. And I will, just as a note, um, I will send a copy of the chat. I don't do that for all of our webinars, but I have found that in brainstorming sessions, especially, um, you all tend to share some really fantastic links and resources and information in that chat. So it kind of becomes a gold mine of information. Um, Casey, uh, Deanna's got her hand up again, if she'd like to speak. Go for it. Or maybe not. And Josh did share in the chat that he's currently running a D&D weekly program um, and had the same idea about transitioning to a student being the dungeon master. Um, he did say, but they have to actually learn the rules <laughs> first. Oh, Olivia, you said that was us are talking about the um, the seasonal items and Publix. Do you have your mic today? She said yes. Catherine said currently spring 2022, the volunteers created and perform a created and performing teen calligraphy club. Photography Club, Music Club, Arts and Crafts Club, Book Club, Creative Writing Club, and a Musical Instrument Petting Zoo. They also help out with Minecraft and more and other programs. We just hosted a telescope program on Monday, January 10th, in collaboration with Clearwater Public Library. Catherine, do you, are, you, um, are you able to mic up? I would love to hear sort of your steps to organizing this, because that's, that's a lot of different directions which is great. So I would love to hear more about how you sort of go about organizing that and keeping track of everything. <laughs> Miriam, do you want to ask that question out loud? I love that question. Oh, I was just saying you pet musical instruments. How cute. <laughs> nice little stroke for the musical instruments. Tickle the ivories. Goochie, goochie, goochie. I would say, you know, for anybody who was a band kid like I was, there there is some like petting of of the instrument. The, the it's your baby. It's your um, no. I love that. And although you do bring up a good point, so if anybody isn't familiar with what um, you know a musical instrument petting zoo, or it could be some other sort of technology petting zoo is. Um, you know, they're set up a little differently, but essentially it's an opportunity for people to come in and just get their hands on things that they wouldn't normally be able to get their hands on. So they can come in and pick up different musical instruments and kind of try them out, see how they feel. Or if it's new technology, they can come in and sort of mess around with the technology and see what that's like. My library has a maker space and we have instruments there. And sometimes the kids just like to touch the instruments. It doesn't have to be turned on and they'll hit the wrong notes many times, but the fact that they get to interact with it seems to be like a big draw. I agree. Frost did pose a question. Um, so Deanna, I know you're in the planning process of the book reviews for volunteer hours, but I also know there were a couple other people in the chat who said they also do this. Um, so Ross's question is, 
for the book reviews and volunteer hours, how many hours do you propose for a review? I'm thinking about doing um, three to five hours, maybe leaning towards the five hours for the younger, at, at least because like our middle schoolers have to also earn um, uh, community service time, our local kids. So they take a little bit longer to read a book, but I'm thinking five hours, but they have to give a review as well. It can't be a spoiler, no spoilers. And um, it has to be better than I just liked the book, you know, or I would, I, I wouldn't recommend it, you know, like it has to be something, something, you know, a paragraph or something that I can stick in the book, like a bookmark. So um, I think that would be okay. And I think that's fair because I know it takes a while to read the book. So five, Five, and then they can do four of them if they want to, and that's 20 hours. Oh, Amelia, I love your idea. Do you have a microphone? Are you able to um, share through mic what you just shared in the chat about the recording? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we have um, our teen volunteers. We got podcasting equipment and um, we just were looking for more ways to use it. So they um, write down their review, they get the wording right, and then they record it and edit it. And then I um, get it ready and we put it on YouTube um, so our patrons can listen to audiobook reviews. And uh, yeah, I give them an hour for the writing of the review and then an hour for the the recording and the editing of it. I love that you're hitting a lot of different types of literacies with just that one activity. <laughs> like obviously the reading piece, but then writing and working with technology, public speaking. Um, that's fantastic. Do you want to share your YouTube link in the chat? Yeah, I can do that. That'd be great. Oh, and Deanna shared that if you use Beanstack, the reviews can be posted on there too. Does anybody know if it's the same for Read Squared? I did want to pose a question, um, and it's probably not a question that will really linger on per se, um, but for those who may not know, um, I do have a Flip Exchange private Facebook group for Florida Library Youth Services staff. Um, so if you'd like to join, I, I will link that in my follow-up email. It's not an overly busy group, which I think has its benefits, um, but by all means, please, I would love more activity in there. Um, but I did get a question in there the other day from somebody who was trying to find out if anybody has partnered with their local transportation, if your community has you know, public transportation, to provide free rides during summer program. And I think especially with like our teen group, I could see where that could potentially be really beneficial. Um, so I'm just curious if anybody else in Florida has done that. Um, so posing that question out there, but again, we don't have to linger on it because that's a pretty, very specific question. Um, and Alex, that is a lot of letters and an acronym. St. John's County Public Library System does that throughout the year, one day a month. Um, are you talking about the transportation or are you bumping back to a different? Sorry, I'm on reference this morning. No, um, you're fine, no transportation. Fine. So we partner with the Sunshine Bus um, to offer um, free rides, um, not necessarily to libraries, but the, the libraries are included. Um, so they have to just show their library card. Um, and I believe it's the first Wednesday each month. Um, it would be cool to expand that during the summer um, for summer programming. But uh, that started last year, I think. Very cool. I may, if you're okay with it, because um, it, was, it was Amy Jane that had requested that from Lee County. 
Um, so if you're okay, I would love to connect the two of you if she has more questions. Yeah, um, I can definitely put her in touch with the people who worked on that. Yeah, that would be great. And so for maybe those who hadn't considered that, but if you have local public transit, that might be a fantastic partnership opportunity. It's great PR for them. Um, and then especially if you have teenagers who are just sitting at home, but maybe their parents are working and they're not yet old enough to drive, it kind of opens up that ability to get to the library. Fantastic. Does anybody, so I know I had asked the question earlier um, and I don't know that anybody really jumped on it. Um, how are you marketing to your teens this year? Are you going into the schools this year or are you sticking mostly virtual? I've started going back into um, some of our schools. Um, uh, also, some of the school advisory councils that I'm on are still meeting virtually, so I'm, I'm going on those and they're giving me time um, during the public comment section to, um, to promote what's going on at the library. Um, so it's been working out really well. And if you're not already on the school um, advisory council, um, I recommend joining because uh, they're always looking for community members to, to join as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Nancy said, our county is still not allowing us into our schools, so we're sending information virtually. And Nancy, which um, which part of Florida are you in? All right, I'm in Miami-Dade County. Um, we're part of a, a system of 49 branches. And even though we're a system, each individual has different little pockets. Like in our community, we have what's called the freebie. So we actually have within the town, they have a free little bus and we're one of the drop off areas. So they are allowed anywhere that they can get a free ride throughout the whole town. But that's not allowed. That's not something that's offered throughout the whole county. It's you just have to download the freebie app. But we are one of the destinations and some people do take advantage of it. And that's year round. That's offered by the town. But that's not um, that's not something that's offered because it, we, Miami-Dade County does cover a large sprawl so and then doing something within the county we would that would have to go further up it's not something that we at individual branches could do. we'd have to pass that on to our administrator who can try to make those partnerships happen but we still i have a instead of going the school route we've done at least on our end i work in partnership with a couple other branches that we've been going um to the aftercare, working with our local county parks, going to the aftercare, and they have teens and tweens, and we they may not come to the library, but we, we do like library on the go, so we go to them. So once a month, we've been offering like STEAM programming. Um, we've done rockets and engineering and circuitry. We're probably gonna do art to do the STEAM art part of the STEAM part this time, but we've we've been doing that. We've been working with them since last summer and it's been a good partnership. So we just maintain it throughout the school year so they don't, so that they are, you know, and they know are aware of our campaigns and everything. We've already gotten several library cards, people that are new members for out of that. So that's helped. Yeah, I think that's also been a common trend is um, taking programming outside the library walls. I mean, which some libraries were doing that three, four years ago anyway, but I, I feel like now it's really become a much more widespread um, sort of trend. Um, so yeah, does anybody have sort of any not inside your building programs that you wanna talk about and share for our teams that people might be able to, to grab onto for summer? I can, uh, if you don't, can I, everyone hear me? Um, I can second what Nancy said is that in because uh, I also work in Miami Dade County, so uh, our relationships have to be like on a library to community basis. It's not something we can do countywide. So I work at uh, on Miami Beach, which is a big tourist area. So a lot of teens are uh, don't stay here for the summer, but we have relationships with local summer camps. So summer camps they may not come every week, but they'll come like maybe 
once or twice during the term of their summer camp program. And then we'll have like, we'll set aside time in our auditorium where they can do crafts and then we'll give them like a tour of the library, like show them how the library system works and have them check out books. But it is something that we have to reach out to them or sometimes if they don't have enough space, they can use our spaces for tweens and teens, but it's something that where we have to reach out to them, they aren't always like reaching out to us. So we have to like do local searches for summer programs or like summer care activities or just the short-term and the long-term programs that we have in the beach area. It's a, um, sometimes they don't realize that we're an option. So a, a lot of the time it's like Googling or going to community outreach events and going, hey, we're a library. We have books, but we have other stuff too, and we can help you guys during the summer. That's fantastic. Yeah, well, and I think it's kind of great, you know, thinking about how big Miami Dade is, I, you know, I think it's kind of great that y'all have the autonomy to be able to build those relationships more locally to you. I mean, because even in communities where that maybe aren't as big as Miami, um, you know, our communities still have very different personalities. You know, we all, you know, in, in every every community is like that. You know, you have certain, you know, just vibes on the west end that maybe you have on the east end, and maybe it's a little bit different than the folks living on the north end. And so it's kind of great when you can really localize those partnerships based on the needs of your immediate surrounding and your immediate patrons. Alex, I love the coffee shop idea. Do you want to share sort of how that came about? And Yeah, there's this, um, this coffee shop that's over on the island um, in St. Augustine Beach, and they're very involved in the community. They're fantastic. Um, and our Anastasia Island branch location um, months ago, I, maybe beginning of last year, uh, maybe longer, I can't remember, um, started meeting there um, with the teens and tweens because they've got a lovely outside area um, and started offering um, their book club there. They also offered it as a hybrid. Um, so she brought her computer with her um, and if they wanted to zoom in, they could. Uh, and it, it worked out really well. Yeah, I think it's always great when you can get local businesses involved as well. Miriam said that when doing outreach, they try to remind local groups and clubs that were more than books. I feel like that is, yes, that's almost a, still, a, a mantra at this point. We're still fighting that stereotype about just books but um one thing that we do emphasize with a lot of like local clubs and groups is that we have meeting spaces and that is becoming more of a rarity in a public space especially for groups that don't have the funds or if you're working with teens just having a space where teens can meet that they don't have to pay for is becoming a rarity so we do try to emphasize that like even if you don't want the books right away, we still have like a large space with tables and chairs that a large group of people can sit and meet around. And which does, it is a big incentive, especially when you have groups of teens who don't necessarily, you know, have the money to go to a coffee shop all the time, especially here in Miami. Like there's very, there's getting fewer and fewer public spaces where large groups of like, especially kids can safely meet. So we do try to emphasize like the meeting space as an alternative. Yeah, I think that's a great point because, you know, we've we've probably all either experienced that ourselves when we were teens or we've observed the sort of reaction a big group of teenagers hanging out in a public space can get, right? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of assumptions <laughs> that are, are made when, when teens gather in groups. Um, so that is one of the wonderful things about library spaces is they are so neutral in that regard. Are you all um, meeting your teens on social media? Are you able to connect with them? There? And I don't mean meet as in meet, but are you connecting with them through social? 
because I know it seems like every year they're they're on a different platform. <laughs> Kate said, we are stuck on Facebook, which is not where our teens are anymore, are they? That's where I was as a teen after MySpace. <laughs> I can speak for uh, Miami-Dade County. We have like uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, but we have uh, certain people, we only have like certain people in charge of our social media. So it goes through them. I mean, which is great because they can they can create like the really nice, like stylized entries that you want. But it seems that every time we get to one platform, they've already moved on to another one. And I think that TikTok's the big one now. And I'm I don't I'm not comfortable filming <laughs> TikToks for teens because I don't know what their what the trends are on each social media platform. But it seems like whatever we do, they're already moved on to something else. So. Twitter and Instagram seem to be a bit really good for us. The irony is that we have certain spaces, like Miriam is a larger branch. She's Miami Beach Regional. I'm on what's called a medium. So it's not, it's more of a neighborhood library. She has what's called a maker space in her space. So she's got a lot more gadgets nice. that if you were able to, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. If you are a, sorry, multitasking. <laughs> if you're able to market and this is the thing is we have a lot of things that but marketing is not our strong suit i want to i wish it was better be able to say hey you want to film those TikToks? we actually have film studios where you can come in and film they have the but in it they cover different regions they have one at miami beach they have one at west kendall they have one at hialeah gardens so they're trying to get the west the North, the South, they, and North Bay Regional. So they have spaces in North Bay and South Bay Regional. They actually have new medias, which are specifically geared for 14 to 19 years old. I really wish they, that's a way to kind of like, hey, film here and it's a safe space and you can, but it's just getting them to come out and do and know that and realize that we have these things and marketing it and it's getting also because half the times we've transitioned to in-person okay no we're back to virtual okay now we're back to in-person and then it's the pivoting we've been pivoting quite a lot we're pivoting back to in-person but it's getting them to know that we're here so that's the challenge yeah and I, I actually, that's a really great segue um, into the next question I was going to ask is, um, you know, does anybody have any challenges they want to throw out to the group? We have such a great hive mind right now. You know, we have 57 people online with varying degrees of experience and resources. Um, so does anybody have anything they're really looking for feedback on or troubleshooting? Um, Kate, you want to, um, or Alex, I see your hand up. And then Kate, I was going to ask if you wanted to vocalize the question you asked in chat. <laughs> no, I have an answer for it. So I'll let her ask the question oh. first. <laughs> I wonder if anyone had any food ideas for this year because we usually try to do one food program at least because we do like six weeks of programming and that's always the tricky one is the food one um i can i can toss mine out real quick um we just restarted our um well started our teen anime cafe um which mixes anime and food um and this summer we're going to be doing um, a one piece themed bento program um, for the teen anime cafe. I've done a bento program in the past with my teen cooking um, and it was so fun. That was years ago. Uh, so highly recommend it. Do you have we a description or a link in, that you can put in the chat? Cause I totally want to steal that idea. We, um, um, we've done this before with the youngers, but um, um, we've done like a layered 
parfait, like individual parfaits. And with between Swedish fish and some of the other candies out there, you could do some sort of layered thing with jello and this and that. So um, that's an idea maybe. Um, I don't know. We, we can't cook here. So that's the, that's kind of limiting. Can I measure something? Because we've also had challenges with food. How we got around that is we did an edible book contest. They bring in food and it's food based, but you're not necessarily worrying about people eating. And they have such great creative ideas. We've done that as our finale for the summer for, I want to say, except for last year, we took a break last year because of, you know, reasons, but it was very successful when we did it as our part of our summer program. You can also do like an Oreo taste testing or anything where there's a lot of different flavors of something. I did that right before um, everything shut down and I had the most teens I've had at a program like ever for that one. And there was one girl who got every single flavor. It was amazing. I just jumped on. Can everyone hear me? Hi. So um, I'm from Newport Ritchie in Pasco County. So I've, I've, most of my teen programs are typically always food-based. Um, I just written in the chat, we just finished a renovation for the last year. And then with COVID before, like I'm kind of starting from scratch, but I know what I'll definitely bring back um, every summer, I would do a chopped competition for the kids where they get like mystery basket items and I give them a pantry to work with. And we have judges and everything. And that was always a huge event. Um, I'm hoping to do it again this summer, but since renovation have kind of, now I have sinks and stuff, but like a lot of the rooms have changed. So I have to kind of figure out how the flow of that's gonna work. Um, so we'll see. But my other ongoing program that I used to do every month, um, because we have a lot of kids that would, as I'm sure many of us do, that would come here after school because mom or dad was working a second job and they didn't really, you know, they had to fend for themselves kind of at home. I started a program that was called Bon Appetines that really just focused on teaching them things that they could make easily at home. So like while every now and again, there would be like a fun twist to it, it really was more like basic approachable food. So if they're cooking for a younger sibling or you know, if they're a latchkey kid, anything like that, that these are all things that they could teach themselves. Cause I'd see they'd all be coming in and just eating like Takis and Mountain Dew every day. And I would just cringe cause they're not getting any kind of good nutrition. So I would always um, try to get stuff that was um, affordable, you know, nothing you have to get like really specific at a gourmet grocery store or anything like that just to teach them. And my favorite one that I did um, was the month after Hurricane Irma, I did a whole series of things that you can make without power. So it was like a peach parfait, but like nothing had to be refrigerated, no electronics. So that was, um, you know, if we're ever in that situation again, hopefully, I mean, hopefully we're not, but <laughs> that uh, they'll, you know, have some tools to be able to do that. So I'm hoping to bring a lot of those back, but that's kind of where I'm at. And there is also some great ideas coming in through the chat. Um, Karen said she did a cupcake wars for a teen volunteer orientation program. Um, Catherine shared some very vital information that Publix will provide cake decorating classes for free. <laughs> I feel like anytime you see the word free, it becomes vital. Um, yeah, these are all great ideas. And if you have them, feel free to keep them coming. I did want to, um, there was a, a question asked in the chat that I want to make sure we also put out there. Um, and I'm trying to find it. Um, Nancy, I think, was asking for a little more clarification on the edible book contest. Okay, well, we had our own, I can send you the rules, if you, I'll put my email in the chat because I have to go find them, but we, and each branch can, each system can set it up however they wanted, but what we've done is the patrons themselves, and they, we separated them into categories, kids, teens, and adults, so you don't have an adult baker going up against a child, and we were able to obtain, um, Again, this is again, we had prizes already set aside that we set aside for them, like gift cards to Publix. 
uh, for the winner. So something as a, a real incentive to come in and they would find a book and then they have to create using food items. It had to be edible items. And then we even, as a way to incentivize, we as staff, we'd put out examples. Like I had someone who used marshmallows to do 101 Dalmatians. I used Twinkies and frosting to do minions. And we would put that out on display and show use do this so that the patrons themselves could see what how it could be as simple or as complicated as they wanted to. And it just had to be based or inspired by a book. And that was the that was the main uh, theme. So we can even do books about the ocean or about the sea. Or you can kind of find but we've done we left it a little bit more open ended. I've had people came in with graham crackers did the Shire from The Hobbit. It was amazing. Some of the stuff and then some of the cutest things I had a kid who did with strawberries and pancakes created dinosaurs. So we didn't want the Shire to go against the dinosaur. So we separated it by age category that year. We're like, no, 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 we have to. And then he got a free dogman book and he was happy with that. And along with a gift card to Publix. But we also having the prize in the in the description helps a lot. Knowing that at the end of it, that they have something tangible that they're going, knowing what they're going to get rather than, oh, you get a prize. And then those books ended up being a bonus. And we had gift cards that came, I mean, free passes to the History of Miami Museum that that ended up being a prize that went along with it because they had given that to us for the summer. Thank you for sharing. Um, these are all great ideas that I really hope end up in that Google Doc as well. Um, especially because I know some of you are uh, in the chat are saying, let me look that up after we get off so I can get, um, so I do hope that you'll sort of circle back around to throw some of this information in. We do have seven minutes and Karen had asked a really good question that I wanted to throw out to the group as well. Um, it's a little less program specific, but more of an umbrella question. Um, and she asked, how are you able to reach your teen group when there is little to no interest and very little in terms of money? And this is probably a topic we could just spend an hour on alone. Um, and what I also might do is see about in a couple months putting together a panel with some, some of you who have really strong teen groups and you've had a lot of success. Um, if you'd be willing to maybe be the voice of experience and expertise where we can focus on that because I know that's such a big deal of, you know, some, some communities have really great teen involvement and other communities really struggle because they just have so many other things going on. Um, so does anybody have sort of a tip or a tidbit Um, I don't, it's hard for me to get a dedicated um, teen uh, group here. So I don't have like a, a real, a big like focus group because we have like a school nearby. So it, everything depends on the schools and the school system. But what I've done is I just give free stuff along with like the most, so we have like a maker space. So we have like a button maker. So I'm always like making buttons or making like little keychains out of perler beads. And that's how I get them to participate, like, um, and sometimes randomly. So, like, we have, I think January 16th is Dragon Appreciation Day. So sometimes I've made, like, dragon buttons and gotten them to talk about dragon books. Hey, do you appreciate dragons today? Here's a dragon button and here are some dragon books, that kind of thing. So I always try to make something tied to what I'm, like, telling them about. But just freebies in general, even if it's something as simple as a button or pencils or highlighters, those are really popular with our teens. I just try to tie that in and it gets their attention. I love that. And Catherine did mention in the chat that she is presenting an online teen volunteer workshop for Swiftland, the Southwest Florida Library Network. Um, in February. Um, so for anybody who's interested, that might work too. Um, so we are now down to four minutes. Um, there's still great information coming in, but I do want to start sort of wrapping up, sort of start wrapping up. 
I do want to ask a question. If this is your first time planning the summer program for your library, first time doing it ever, will you click that hand raise button really quickly? I just want to sort of see who's going at this for the first time because I know we've had a lot of staff changes in Florida. Um, and I've, I'm seeing a lot of names in here that are new to me, which is fantastic. So if this is your first where you are involved in the planning, we have a couple folks. Deanna says she has an assistant. Well, thankfully, she's got an expert leading her along, huh? <laughs> so in the last two minutes, um, I, I closed out the children's discussion with this too. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to pose sort of the last question. Um, for those of you who have been doing this for a long time, either in the chat or if you have a mic, will you share just one quick tip for our folks who are new at this this year um, even if they're not in the room right now they may come back and watch the recording later so what is something that you know if you have one piece of advice to share with somebody who's doing this for the first time ever from your learned experience what would that be don't be afraid to try it put it out there if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You move from there, you, you review and move on. I love that. Sometimes I think we stop ourselves because we're afraid of failure. Um, I would just say have fun with it. If you don't have fun, they're not gonna have fun and they can tell right away if you don't like it, you're doing something. So just try to make it fun for you because sometimes we take the planning so seriously, we forget to have fun with it. You want to have fun play bird bingo i can't keep a straight face with that one <laughs> wait a minute what is this bird bingo you can't drop something like that in the last two minutes and then expect us to walk away from it <laughs> if you've ever if you've it, i think it's sold by like chronicle books or it's you can get it through chronicle books and um, it's it's a great bingo game, but come on. Some if you even think about some of the birds' names, you just I'm so immature. I, I have a hard time playing it. So <laughs> but it's fun. <laughs> and the winners get like a little notebook from Dollar Tree or whatever, you know, we just have fun. I'm writing that down. Um Shantaria said try to make activities teen led as much as possible which I think is really important for teen programming. And there's lots of great advice coming in through the chat as well. Kate said, join homeschool Facebook groups. Catherine said, be happy, go with the flow, adapt. Not all programs are a huge success. If one person shows up, it's a success. If you're offering free food, just be prepared to eat a lot of it after the fact sometimes. <laughs> um, oh, Jessica, so I know you put this in the chat, but I would love it, um, oh, it's 11 o'clock. As our, as our last thing, I know if you have to go run off, but Jessica, will you actually come back on mic if you can and share? Because I think that is such a valuable piece of advice. Sure. So this will be my 11th summer, I think. So what I got into the habit of doing a few years ago is at the very end, like as I'm doing my statistics and everything, I make a big list of like what worked really well that summer, what didn't in terms of like programming and tracking and prizes and pretty much everything. Because I know it's really easy to be like, oh, I'll remember to do this next year. And then like the next week I forgot who I am. So um, when I start programming and planning for the following summer, the first thing I do is pull up my notes to go over them just to kind of lead me and, you know, to figure out what direction I want to go in so I don't repeat anything that didn't work last year or to kind of help me figure out what where to go. So I love it. Thank you so much.
All right, we are one minute over. Um, thank you all so much. I love these brainstorming sessions and really an opportunity for people to get together across the state and share information. The recording will be coming, resources will be coming. You all have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and we will see you online another time. Bye.